On this edition of the Best of the Web of Conspiracy, I uh, take a look back to my Friday, uh, June 7th show from 2013, where I, for the first time, discussed Sasquatch. Um, uh, I've had to, you know, kind of edit a few things, but for the most part, this is just exactly what I presented. Uh, feel free to uh, uh, comment, let me know what you think, um, and I hope you enjoy the show. years, we're going to get into Bigfoot. And like I had said before, I, I had I've always wanted to do a show on Sasquatch and Bigfoot, but I hadn't really got into feeling like, well, where do I want to put it in? Because believe it or not, I do have a method to my madness in terms of what show I do when. Um, I certainly try to, uh, to make my shows relevant and make my shows timely. So trying to find the right time to go into uh, Bigfoot or Sasquatch, well, I just felt like you know, now was the time. I had spent a few weeks talking about some of the, uh, the government uh, things, so I figured I need to shift it back a little bit to the other spectrum that I like to talk about here on the show. So, Bigfoot, what exactly is this creature? Well, for those who have uh, witnessed it, claim to have witnessed it, uh, they claim it's a creature, approximately six to roughly uh, ten feet tall. Sometimes you hear some a little smaller and a little bigger. Uh, Ape-like in appearance. Um, just huge, huge, um, several hundred pounds in weight. Um, of course, enormous footprints. Uh, that's, of course, where they get the, b b the Bigfoot uh, name. Uh, approximately about two foot long and about eight inches wide. So these are significantly huge footprints. Um, people also report a strong, really nasty, unpleasant odor associated with uh, the, the Bigfoot. Now, there's some other different types of Bigfoot-type creatures out there that people have talked about over the years. Of course, Sasquatch, which is a, a Native American term. Uh, this is a term that certainly many Native American tribes have lore of these types of creatures. Um, there's the Yeti in the uh, Himalayans. And there's the skunk ape, uh, I believe that is in the, uh, the uh, southern part of the states, the United States. And then uh, here where I'm from, there's also legend of the Ohio Grassman. Uh, there's reports of the Ohio Grassman going back to the 1800s uh, here in Ohio. So there's all kinds of different names for these types of creatures. And um, I'll get into this a little bit later, but I tend to think that all these creatures are related to uh, a certain extent one way or another. Um, now, moving forward here, let's talk a little bit about the history. Now, I've kind of touched on this a little bit. Certainly, indigenous people throughout North America, the Native Americans, um, they, as well as, you know, almost every other continent in the planet, have reports and have lore about these types of creatures. So there's something, it appears, in our history that would indicate that we have had some sort of interaction with a creature of this type. Uh, that much as a historian from what I have gathered, um, I could look at it as, okay, this is perhaps just a myth, but when you see these types of universal uh, things occurring, to me it sends up a red flag that this is possibly more than just a myth. Otherwise it is a universal myth that would have had to have traveled with us for thousands of years. Um, and that's certainly possible, but for me, I tend to think that this is something a little greater. Um, in, in looking at some of the more modern um, sightings, I think perhaps the most famous for those of us in the United States uh, occurred on October 20th of 1967. Uh, this was when uh, Roger Patterson and Robert Gimlin captured a reported Bigfoot on film. Uh, this film has been seen everywhere. Stills have been taken from it. Um, it is certainly the most controversial in many respects. Um, there was a friend of uh, Gimlin and Patterson who had claimed that they were actually dressing up in an ape suit, um, and it was them. Now, Patterson and Gimlin denied this. And then the interesting thing, I think, for me is uh, I know that there had been some recent work done. Uh, Hollywood special effects people you know, claimed that it would have been really difficult to replicate uh, this creature, especially in 1967, given the technology 
and the, the prosthetics and the ability to create the, the suits to make it look as, as authentic as it does. Uh, it, the, these Hollywood special effects, people find it very difficult to imagine that that could have been done. So to me, there seems to be a little bit of, okay, well, all right. There perhaps really is something. We're claiming to have remains of the creatures throughout the years, and uh, oftentimes these turn out to be hoaxes. And to me, that is perhaps the single biggest uh, obstacle and challenge to cryptozoologists who study Bigfoot. And for that matter, not just cryptozoologists, but mainstream scientists, biologists, anthropologists who study this and and attempt to study this from their field's perspectives. Uh, there are certainly those in the more mainstream sciences who do study. Uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum of uh, Idaho State is certainly perhaps the best known. Uh, there are some others, but there are uh, people out there who do try to approach this from a serious perspective um, and don't just look at it as a crypto type of creature, but perhaps that this is uh, something more. So this isn't just an alternative uh, science uh, phenomenon, but this is also crossing over. And these hoaxes are perhaps the one of the biggest problems in this field. I mean, uh, I believe it was last year there was someone who had dressed up in, uh, in, in a ghillie suit uh, attempting to look like a, uh, a Sasquatch. And then, um, you know, they wound up getting hit uh, by a car as they were trying to cross the road. I don't know really what goes on inside these people's heads when they think that this is something that would be cool or fun to do. Um, I think that if you're going to do this, you certainly should stay off the road. But, okay, whatever. This guy decided he was uh, going to get in the road, and it cost him his life. So, <laughs> unfortunately for him, that's a lesson hard learned. Um, as we look at some of the possible theories about Sasquatch, there are a ton of different theories out there. And they are just theories, because it is very difficult to have solid evidence um, in terms of what these creatures are. Uh, I, th- I tend to find myself that, that there's perhaps a couple theories that I tend to uh, believe a little bit more firmly, and uh, I certainly have a little little bit more leaning to. But we're going to talk about a few of these here and uh, kind of just kind of give a little bit of an overview. Um, the first you know, kind of, uh, you know, theory out there is that, is that Bigfoot is, in a sense, a kind of a lost species of, of humanoids. Um, like a, just a, some sort of mistake that happened or this evolutionary kind of junction that kind of went a different way. And we could have been, gone in this direction, but instead we went this way and they went that way. So that's what the, these creatures are, that they're just an offshoot of a type of human. Um, there are also... Of course, this going back to Native American lore that believe that the, that the Bigfoot is a Native American spirit, um, that basically that it's sort of like a harbinger that brings uh, you know, signs or messages that there's need for a change or a cleansing that's needed. Um, so there's a definite kind of a mystical type of uh, uh, aura around the Bigfoot. Um, there are those who also believe that Bigfoot is perhaps a type of like an extraterrestrial or an alien type of creature, uh, simply because, and for those of you who had a chance to uh, listen to the interview with Raven Meinhold, we cert- Mindell, sorry, uh, we had uh, talked to him quite a bit of detail about the multiple phenomena occurring in different places. Uh, and this is an example where there are lots of uh, you know, UFO sightings associated with uh, uh, and strange lights associated with the uh, the Bigfoot. So there's some concern, some question that perhaps, uh, you know, there's an, an alien aspect to the Bigfoot. Um, there are also those who think uh, that perhaps Bigfoot is uh, a type of interdimensional being. Uh, and certainly those of you who listened to my show uh, probably about a month back now, I had kind of gone into a little bit of discussion about interdimensionals and uh, the string theory, and, and this certainly seems to be, uh, seems to be a, a highly possible um, phenomenon that perhaps these Sasquatches can move in and out of dimensions and that uh, they, they exist on a different dimension and can appear and can move into our dimension and move out. 
that would certainly explain a lot of sort of the uh, the elusive nature of the creature. That perhaps it's there, and then once it knows it's been sighted, it moves into its other dimension where it can still see us, but we are not able to see it. So there's some definite uh, interest in possibly, um, you know, what that might be. You know, the, the, there could be some corollary there. Um, another possibility that I've heard and, and I've come across is that, in fact, Bigfoot is actually a human. Um, that perhaps that this is just a, 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 a human that is sort of malformed um, and perhaps has some some serious genetic issues that has created um, them to look and take on these kinds of appearances. Um, that would certainly um, be intriguing theory. However, I'm I, I'm not 100% sold on on that being the case. In, in that there are multiple sightings throughout the world, there would have to be these types of genetic anomalies occurring uh, pretty much uh, throughout throughout the world. So I'm not um, 100% certain that this is a, a more plausible theory. However, it is one that certainly people have uh, put out there as a possibility. Um, another uh, theory is that, um, you know, I guess it's sort of and I, this one I, I'm not really sure about as this being uh, another plausible one, but there's been one where uh, it's actually been being confused as a giant ground sloth. Uh, I'm not sure that I buy that either, but it's thrown it out there. I think some of the more uh, other common uh, explanations as to what a, a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot might be, um, certainly there's people who claim, well, people are just misidentifying bears or, or other wildlife and, uh, by all means, I do think that there's a possibility that in some cases that there is some misidentification. Um, I think that if you have people who are in, a, in an element that perhaps they're not used to being in and you throw them into uh, a wilderness area and they're not used to seeing uh, bears in the wild or some other animals in the wild, that perhaps they are making some confusion. However, I do think that we have to be careful about um, looking at the witnesses. I think that you, when you talk to somebody who's you know, witnessed uh, Sasquatch, who has lived most of their lives in the woods, in the wilderness, and they know the creatures, they know the woods. Um, I tend to listen to their reports with, with, with a little more sincerity in that they are familiar with their surroundings. They know they've seen. This isn't something new to them. Uh, I think if you take someone straight out of an inner city who's never spent a day of their lives in the wilderness, there's a chance they could misidentify. I think you take somebody who's lived their entire lives in the woods, in the wilderness, hunting, trapping, and, and living that type of life, they're going to be a better witness in terms of knowing what they see on a day-to-day -day basis. So the reports that come from people who have lived in those areas and know the wildlife I tend to take those very seriously. Um, I think that those are certainly some of the better uh, testimonies. Um, a theory that I, I had come across that was uh, um, kind of put out there by David Icke, uh, for those of you who are uh, familiar with him, he certainly uh, talks about reptilians, ironically enough. Um, uh, he's uh, quite a bit of work on that. Uh, but he also uh, has this uh, theory on his site uh, about um, Bigfoot is perhaps a species that um, that has been been here on the the planet, perhaps has been here before us, and actually sort of evolved from a Native American uh, tribe of basically a practice some form of shamanism, where um, they sort of developed these attributes as a way of being uh, defending themselves. If they were a peaceful tribe that had to basically come into warfare with the combination of other tribes that fought, as well as uh, uh, the European descent upon uh, Native Americans, and that these tribes became uh, this advanced uh, group that became bigger, stronger, and practiced this, these, these shamanistic beliefs and had this type of 
of magical type of power to um, to kind of move in between and do some of the things and be the elusive creature that uh, we've all come to kind of recognize as what Sasquatch actually is. Um, that as they as they progressed, they became something transdimensional and had telepathic type of abilities and all these strange features that uh, these creatures seem to have they developed as a, as a response to threats they were receiving and this theory is not just applicable towards Native Americans but also uh, other parts of the world where these creatures are and that these tribes had um, you know sort of uh, also had some more experiences across across the globe and in some respects, you can tie that in with the, uh, the North American ape theory. And I'll kind of get into that a little bit here as well. Um, I think another possibility uh, that gets brought up quite a bit, and it's certainly I think this is what uh, Dr. Jeff Meltram, uh, I think this is sort of his belief on this, is that the, the Sasquatch are actually a blood, believed to be extinct uh, primate called a Gigantopithecus, uh, which was basically matches in many ways the description of uh, these Sasquatch. And they have found remnants of these in China and places uh, around China that would seem to indicate that there, there is evidence uh, that there was this huge type of primate that did exist on this planet. So it's intriguing that perhaps, perhaps there are some of these Gigantopithecus left and that they have managed to survive in these very remote locations uh, over the over the, the hundreds and hundreds of years. So, and, and actually more like thousands. So, it, that to me seems to be another compelling theory when looking at what these might be. Um, tying that into the North American ape theory, there is this idea that that these that these Gigantopithecus that they evolved and they basically came to North America in much the same way that Native Americans came to North America, and that was, you know, crossing the land bridge that once existed in the Bering Strait between Russia and Alaska. That all of these primates, including you know early human, uh, advanced that way, and that's how we have these type of Sasquatch and, and uh, Bigfoot and Grassman type of sightings. Is that these creatures uh, basically came? with man, so to speak, following the same type of path. Uh, that certainly is an intriguing component to the theory as well. So once again, I think that might be one that carries a little bit of uh, a little bit of weight with it, if in fact um, that they are Gigantopithecus. Um, there's also some theories that this is another type of, of, of hominid as well, and I sort of touched on this, but I think it homo, and bear with me here, because I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly, but Homo Heidelberg Gen Genesis, I believe, is what this was referred to. Um, that it's an essentially an extinct human ancestor, um, and it's believed that perhaps they might have survived. Uh, so that's certainly a possibility. There does seem to be a strong component to the idea that um, that Sasquatch is this. Uh, I don't know that you would basically say that Sasquatch is a distant relative uh, to mankind. Um, and that has come up in, in quite a few different theories. Now, um, one thing that I found interesting, and I had uh, brought this question up uh, with uh, Raven Mindell last uh, Saturday, uh, there was a recent study, a DNA study that was being conducted uh, by Dr. Melba Ketchum, a Texas uh, veterinarian, uh, where she uh, claimed, basically uh, was given these uh, samples of Sasquatch DNA, believed to be Sasquatch DNA, from places where people had spotted them and uh, they had found hairs and things of that nature. And, and, most, and, and, this, and apparently, from my understanding in this case, that this DNA was handled and processed in many cases by police departments. So... And it was handled it with, with care so that there wouldn't be any kind of contamination. And this study basically occurred over a five years period of time. And Dr. Ketchum claims that, that 
basically this this is a type of human relative that it's something that you know that had existed thousands of years ago but had believed to have died off um, so this would certainly tend to lead a little bit of credence to the beliefs of those who think that this is some some type of of uh, ancient hominid, some sort of ancient relative to man that just evolved in a different way. Um, however, and, and, and let me also add too that uh, Dr. Ketchum basically at that point began arguing that um, you know the government then needs to protect these these uh, beings that they're that they're you know uh, basically a rare form of hominid they need to be protected. Um, However, this study is basically uh, it's being criticized heavily, and there's a, there's a few different reasons for this. Um, one of the, the, the concerns about this is that th these results were published in this past February in a journal uh, that was this, I think it was uh, De Novo. But essentially, this journal was created for um, it was created essentially for these results. Uh, no other journal was really thrilled about the idea of, uh, at least what she claimed, was that there weren't other journals that were thrilled about the idea of, uh, of basically picking up this mantle and, and, and publishing these types of results, that they really just didn't want to, um, they didn't really want to put themselves out there in a way that would make them appear to be less authentic. So... She argues that what no other journal would touch this, despite the fact that there was independent analysis that was done on the DNA, and that essentially this journal appeared out of, out of thin air, and it's the very first volume, very first issue, and it has just this study. Um, for those who work, who, who are scientists or who are academics who publish research for a living, uh, there is this idea of peer review, and the problem with this, with her releasing these, this information in this way, you need to have independent review from people who are in the field who can, who can question these results, and not only that, but can look at what you've done and replicate the process and determine that, okay, this is actually true. Uh, certainly, in, 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 as a historian, um, any work that was published that done or anybody else in the field, whatever you do, it's out there and it has to be put out there for your peers to critique it, to critique your methods, to critique what you've done, to determine the veracity of your work. And in this case, this doesn't really appear to have been done. So in an attempt to try to make this a, a more scientific type of study, we are looking at a, once again, okay, we're close, and, I, and I, I'm not a huge fan of the term pseudoscience, but we're sort of there, where, okay, all these methods have been done, but in the end, the proper channels, the things that needed to be done, weren't. So it's frustrating for those of us who uh, you know, see ourselves in, 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 in the vein of you know, uh, academics or, or researchers or, or you know, in some cases, in this particular case, scientists who want to um, approach this through strict methods and want to see these types of methods applied as much as possible in the fields of the, you know, the paranormal and the unexplained. And then we have these kinds of things where almost everything had been done right, except, well, okay, well, we didn't go through the proper channels in terms of, uh, of properly getting other analysis. Now, to be the devil's advocate, by all means, uh, you could look at it and perhaps that other people, other scientists who would uh, who would uh, attempt to look at this would perhaps just dismiss it out of hand and completely criticizing it without giving it uh, a truly fair analysis. And that's possible, by all means. And it would be a shame, but it, it would not surprise me if, in fact, some in the mainstream did. So, there we are where we can almost have evidence, but it's not quite good enough to pass the, the test. So we're left with this in between. Um, I applaud the efforts, and I hope that we can continue to move in this kind of direction. 
but I also hope that we can continue to try to to gain a greater access to the mainstream, have uh, mainstream uh, scientists approach this from the perspective of scientists and be willing to look at the evidence in an objective manner. Uh, that's the key. So I, I have to say that I applaud the efforts, but it's just not quite there. It's a start, and that's important. But we need more scientists to do more of this type of work. Uh, with and, and we need to promote the, the openness of this kind of subject and this kind of material because you find real scientists are afraid to touch it because they're afraid of damaging their credibility. When the truth is we need, we need true scientific methods to promote this type of research. This is key. So it's a start, but there's more work to do, much more work to do. Um, now, in terms of what I think the Sasquatch might be, I have to tell you, I'm not sure. And normally I like to be able to give uh, a pretty solid commitment one way or another as to what I think it might be. And I have a few ideas that I lean towards. Uh, just from my reading and my research, um, but I'm not sure. I have to admit, um, in my time here on the show, I have mentioned a, a few of my experiences I've had with the paranormal that I know. I've talked about the experiences that I've had with what I believe to be the, uh, the, the ghost of my father when he had passed. I had talked about um, seeing some uh, an unusual lights in, in the sky and my grandparents' home and their and their rural farm, and I've talked about these experiences. And the one experience that I've been the most hesitant to talk about uh, was one that occurred to me when I was uh, approximately about 13 or 14 years old, uh, living in the rural part in, of Ohio that I did growing up. I spent a lot of time out in the woods, and uh, I, I spent a lot of time you know, hunting as a, as a as a child. I spent a lot of time uh, just being out in the woods because that's where I was. And my friends and I would go out and, and uh, we would go out in the woods and they'd spend, this is of course in the days before, uh, you know, your PS3s and your Xbox and Xbox 360, we actually spent time outside and we would spend hours, uh, you know, a day you know, and about running around out in the woods, just climbing trees, exploring. And that's, that's what we did. And I had an experience uh, with a few of those friends where we had encountered uh, what we believed to be a Sasquatch. Uh, I don't want to go into a whole lot of details about where this was at. Uh, I can tell you, once again, it was in a rural part of Ohio. Um, this creature, uh, for those of you who may be wondering, uh, did, I, did, I, uh, did I misidentify? No. Uh, very familiar with what a bear is. Uh, and I can tell you that this thing was bipedal, and while, yes, I know bears do get up on their hind legs, this thing had very long legs, and it, strode, it, it, it walked on two legs for quite a bit of distance. It actually ran on two legs and covered a lot of ground very quickly. The shoulder width of this creature was tremendous. Uh, I've never seen anything with as broad shoulders upright. Uh, it was the... Uh, the size of this thing scared the hell out of me. Um, it must have been the the from shoulder to shoulder. Uh, I would have to say close to six feet in width from shoulder to shoulder. A little more than six feet. Tremendously huge. Um, it in height when it was standing up. I'd have to tell you that it was probably close to eight and a half to nine feet tall. Tremendous size. Um, I saw it for probably approximately about a minute before it ran off out of sight. The only reason that we even knew, uh, the only reason that we even stopped is we were moving through the woods. We had heard something. We got this god awful smell, which at the time we thought there was something dying, something that was rotten. And we were up on a ridge and we happened to, uh, my one friend, I won't reveal his name, happened to witness, see something, and he basically said, guys, you need to get down. And so, because at first, I think we don't, we really weren't sure what we were seeing. 
and he, we see this thing, and we watch it for a solid minute before it ran off, and we were so scared, you know, we didn't think to try to gain any kind of physical evidence, you know, certainly now, in the hindsight, I wish I would have, I wish I would have done a little bit more, but, uh, you know, young teenage kids in the woods, and we didn't want, and, and certainly by all means, we didn't anybody. You, you, you tell somebody what you saw, at least from where we were from, and they're going to look at you like, okay, are you, what, what are you taking? What kind of drugs are you on? Or what kind of mental illness do you have? And so we didn't say anything to anybody about it uh, for the longest time. Uh, so after having that kind of experience, you know, that made me a believer in what it was that I saw. Now, do I think that it could be a, a, a rare type of primate? A rare type of primate? Absolutely. I think there could be something very much to the idea of the type of gigantopithecus or something like that that has managed to survive these years. Um, I do think, however, that it's important to acknowledge that there's other types of phenomena that are often associated uh, in areas where Sasquatch are spotted. And I, I, I see this often in the research. I see this often in reports. So I have to wonder. Uh, I can't quite dismiss that completely out of hand. Um, so I, I'm somewhere in between those two theories, I think, for the most part, in terms of what I believe it might be. The important thing, and, and we have to talk about this, and just to hark a little bit back to what Dr. Ketchum had mentioned, if in fact this is a living species or some type of humanoid species, there are significant consequences to this thing existing. And for those of you who watched America's Book of Secrets on, on uh, History History, Ch History Channel 2 or History 2H2, I know they did a thing on it a couple weeks back, and I caught some of it. I didn't see the whole thing, but I do know that there was some who believe that there's a government conspiracy to this. And there is an element of this in that if we find this species, prove it, and we have to protect it, there has to be a protection of this, you're talking about, significant harm being done to a number of industries uh, and economic development, particularly in the timber industry, right? Where you're having to protect the habitat of these creatures, and now all of a sudden you have to shut down you know, lumber, you know, timber production, all this, the, the tree, you know, the, the, the logging efforts that are, that are done. You, you, you have to halt all of that. You have to protect their environment because we don't know how many of these things might actually be left. You know, where, so you have to wonder if there is an element of, of this kind of thing going on where, okay, you know, maybe maybe somebody in the government, you know, maybe the, the Forest Service, you know, there, there are some questions there. And I think that, that that certainly deserves a little bit of investigation. But there does appear to be an element of, can you imagine what if we do prove this to be true, what kind of changes have to be done and the amount of money that stands to be lost? Uh, an economic uh, development that stands to be lost by having to acknowledge these creatures and protect them, much in the way other rare animals and, 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 and endangered animals have to be protected. The efforts that we have to do to protect those, the kind of damage that, that, that they do to the economies in those areas, you have to wonder if that is an element and possibly why you know, perhaps the government is going to be really careful about the direction of which um, you know, how, how much we can support investigation into this type of creature. Um, it's, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely something to consider. If we have another type of human out there, then we have to reconsider everything and we have to find a way to protect this, this creature. If we can prove that it exists. Okay. Well, that's about all that I have for the, the Sasquatch thing. And I certainly look, for those of you who've had experiences, I would welcome, uh, you know, any any of your, if you feel like sharing them, you know, email, email the show, webofconspiracy at gmail.com. You know, share on Twitter, Facebook, wherever you feel comfortable. If you prefer email, just to kind of maintain some anonymity, I don't blame you. Uh, but I'd love to hear some other stories from some of the listeners out there that may have had experiences with this kind of thing. Uh, certainly also welcome your feedback on the show as well. Um, I'm uh, trying to work on, you know, uh, kind of doing some different things with the show, and, and uh, I'm, I'm enjoying the progress, and I've gotten a lot of good feedback, and I'd like to continue that as much as possible. 